Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, at the time when we invited you, the company had not gone public. We didn't know you were going IPO. So I guess we did some magic touch. <coughs> so that helped. So congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and by the way, uh, just for the audience, I think uh, you, know, you are, I think, the only IPO that I have seen in the recent past where the company is actually profitable. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for all the Zoom users. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So how many people here use Zoom? <laughs> Let's do with a clap. We can't see you. Uh. All right. Let's uh, do like a Bollywood movie. Let's go back in time. Um, the year 2006 or something when you joined Webex? 1997. 1997. Paint a picture for us. What was it like? Because Webex was a very hot company at that time, and you knew Subra and Min, who yep. I also know very well. Yeah. I came to Silicon Valley in 1997, and from China, I tried to get a visa here, and I got rejected eight times. And in NASA attempt, I was successful. When I came here, you know, company Webex was very small. Right? Subra is the co-founder, CEO, Min. Is the co-founder and the CTO, only another eight or nine engineers. And uh, I had to write a code for many years. And mm. uh, the good news, you guys do not use WebEx anymore. The code I wrote in 1998 is still running there. So I was working very, very hard to write a code. Every, quite often on Friday night, I just worked the whole night. So, yeah. I think all the engineers appreciate that. And you are here in a place which is, I think, uh, safe for all immigrants. We've all been through this pain, so great uh, to hear that story. So let's move forward a little bit. 2011. Yep. You started the company. Yep. Uh, people probably don't have an appreciation of what the market was like, right? There was yep. WebEx was dominating, yep. go to meeting, log me in, and probably 20 other companies that maybe kind of are on the you know dying yep. side of things. That's right. So why did you decide to go after that market? Actually, you know, before I left, I was, uh, you know, talking with the WebEx customers every day. And I, I felt like WebEx is more like, uh, you know, my baby as well, because I'm part of that. And 13 years and, and 14 years of hard work. And finally, every day when I talked with the WebEx customer, I did not see a single happy customer. And every day when I woke up, I really don't want to go to office. I felt very, very embarrassed you know, to see so many unhappy customers. I was not thinking about leaving Cisco WebEx. I was trying to fix that problem. But uh, unfortunately, looking back, fortunately, Cisco was unwilling to change. And uh, they told me that no need to rebuild WebEx. And it took me one year. I failed to convince them. So finally, I decided to leave to try to build a new solution to bring happiness back to WebEx customers. Interesting. So it's, it's kind of. Uh, you know, interesting when you uh, think about it that even when in 2009, uh, you know, there was uh, also Blue Jeans was funded very heavily. Yep. Another Cisco alum, yep. Krish, um, who was on his third venture at that time. So he was what we call a serial entrepreneur. Yep. And you had a lot of things stacked against you. So what, <laughs> what made it work for you? I'm not sure if the Chris here or not. He's my good friend. So, and uh, yeah, Blue Jeans, they started uh, two years uh, before us. And it was recently, several months ago, I also had a lunch with him. He's a very good friend, even on business front, who are competitors. I think before I left Cisco, I did a talk with Chris. I tried to understand why he's building a solution like that. You know, I think uh, there was a problem back in the 2010, you know, 2009 time frame. You know, the, the enterprise, the video collaboration you know, market like uh, Polycom or Cisco only used for on-prem in collaboration. You know, also some companies are using the Skype before. You know, how to interpret it between Skype and video, video endpoint like Polycom mm -hmm. Cisco, for sure, that's a very valid uh, you know, the, the problem. And uh, Chris wanted to fix that problem. But I know that it's, it's a, this is a great prob problem. However, it's more like a feature, really hard to build a huge business you know, upon that. You know, that's, you know, from our perspective, is a little bit different, because 
you know, we, we spend so much time, you know, build a collaboration solution like WebEx, we really understand the customer pain point. Mm -hmm. We wanted to build a, a new solution from the ground up. We do video first cloud architecture. You know, not only for interoperability, but also for support all the devices, conference room system, one solution, a new architecture, and uh, I think uh, it's totally different architecture. And uh, you know, plus I know Chris very well. He's also working very hard. And uh, I think another difference I know that you know I still can review the code, right? And uh, I do not think Chris is doing that, but his golf is much better than me. So, yeah. so. How hard was it for you to raise money? Because I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs here who are saying, gosh, you know, why raising money is so hard? It must have been really easy for Eric. So Oh, that's extremely, extremely hard. And uh, I can tell you, actually, early stage, and uh, because you look at those investors, and they all look at the market opportunity. If you really deep dive on the market, nobody will invest you. Because the market is so crowded, right? And uh, nobody thought we can pull it off. That's why when I try to raise the money, I only got the money from all the friends in the city run and the A run. Only two institutional investors. One is uh, Yahoo co-founder Jerry. Another is uh, head of uh, Qualcomm Ventures, uh, Nagaraj. Oh, only those two. And every time I saw Jerry and Nagaraj, I wanted to give them a, a hug because those two, only those two, nobody else wanted to invest. Yeah. So what's your advice to other entrepreneurs who are kind of in the same boat? What should they do? Don't they, give up. You know, try hard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I kind of see you've been doing, you know, like the conventional wisdom of Silicon Valley doesn't seem to jive with you. It, it looks like everything you've done is kind of not what the conventional wisdom seems to be, and you've proven everybody wrong, which is very interesting and amazing. Uh, you know, like you know, doing a good customer validation before starting a product, that's something unique? I think because, you know, we, we built a solution before, right? And see, I give you an example, like this morning, G3, she was here. She's, uh, you know, CEO of Airstar Networks. She, she's my mentor, right? And she, she did something, you know, it's, I, I see even better than, than Zoom because, you know, the, the, for the networking industry, industry, right? The Cisco even more, you know, dominating in that industry, right? Look at what she did, right? It's built a much better solution, and also it's more like a cloud and network, you know, architecture. You know, we are taking something similar, you know, the same market, but uh, we, we are taking a different approach, build a brand new new solution ahead mm -hmm. of any other competitors. If you really wanted to you know, build something innovative, it's hard to, to, to validate you know, in the market first. They, they may not know that. That's why you got to build a solution if you really understand that, right? So build a solution first. Yeah. So um, you, know, you started the company instead of the 20-something, which most of the current entrepreneurial crop is. You, know, you were having kids who were approaching that age when you started this. So which is hope for everyone else here in the audience who is in that age group. So what went through your mind? What was like looking at the security and you know, all the things that we deal with as parents to make sure that there is always money available? What was your thinking? I think when I started a company, I was very old. It's already 41 years old, right? That's another reason why investors, they do not want to invest in me. So, and I would say, you know, as long as you have one idea, and you really want to pursue your dream, the sooner is better. And one of the mistakes, mistakes I made you know, after I started Zoom, I just realized, wow, this is a great experience. If I knew that, I should have left you know, Cisco WebEx much earlier. I think to pursue a dream and really build something better right, you know, than any other competitors, you know, try to do something better to make the world a much better place, really care about the customers, I think you will have a lot of fun. Okay. So having done a few startups, I think we all know that you know, founding a company is a very lonely journey. And it gets really hard. And that's when people say you know, it's good to have co-founders. And most of the company's conventional wisdom seems to be that. Uh, interestingly, the market cap of companies started by single founders has been higher recently. I was reading some stat. So how was it for you? What, what went through that? And how did you kind of overcome any of the challenges that came through with that? Yes, yeah, so for sure, you know, when you start a company, you know, quite often you have uh, two or three co-founders, and sometimes just a you know, sole founder. 
And, and while I was at Cisco, sorry, at WebEx, and uh, you know, the two co-founders, Subla and Amin, you know, I remember early stage, and Subla and Amin, they, they closed the door, you know, they, they drew something on the whiteboard for several hours. And sometimes they agreed with each other, sometimes they disagreed. I know there's a pros and cons, right? You know, for sure you're not that lonely. You can always share with your co-founders. For sure, you know, startup company, everything is about speed, right? If you can make a, a, a right decision, you know, in a timely manner, it, it, I think that's okay. You may not need to have a co-founder. That's what, what I learned. So, and you're right, it's very lonely. You know, sometimes, you know, nobody's going to help you. But uh, if you really enjoy that, I think that should be okay. Especially in Silicon Valley, there's so many great entrepreneurs. You know, like I mentioned, whenever I have issues, you know, I want, hey, I send an email to Jishri, I call her, you know, we have a coffee, I learn from her, and also talk with other mentors, you know. I have many other mentors, like, uh, you know, also part of the uh, Taikon members, like, uh, you know, Pankaj Patel and, uh, you know, Prem Jin, you know, they all can help me. And it's quite often, you know, when you never feel lonely, hey, send an email to them and ask them for help, they all help me. That's why from that perspective, I do not feel lonely anymore. That's good. I, I think, you know, the mentoring and having, having the right mentor is really very one, important. Yeah. one important way. Yeah. And I know you mentioned a lot of names, like Subra was... Yeah, this also is great. an yeah. investor for you, and yep. Jayshree has been a mentor. So, yep. what are what are the things that you know now you are ready to mentor? So, what do you think a mentee who is trying to get the best out of a mentor? What should they do? But first of all, you got to you know be proactive, right? Like uh, you know nobody else they know you have a problem. Right? You, you got to be proactive. Reach out to others, right? Hey, I have this problem. This is my sort of you know, process. What do you think about that? If you, uh, if, you, you know, if you try to resolve this problem, you know, can you share with me some tips? And always be proactive. And in the Silicon Valley and worldwide as well, I think lots of very successful entrepreneur leaders, they all want to help. Right? Like quite often also receive some uh, uh, messages you know, from LinkedIn. They ask for some questions. I, I never you know, uh, you know, said no. I always try to help as well because I learn a lot from other successful entrepreneurs, leaders. I think to be proactive, I think uh, it can really help you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I understand you didn't have anybody in your sales and marketing in the early phases of the company, which is also another unconventional thing in some sense. And how did you get your first 100 customers? So we were very lucky. We got our first customer, Stanford Continuing Studies Group, and even before we have a sales team. And uh, you know, given that we get a first customer is a uh, you know, high ed, and the second or third customer also from high ed you know, colleges as well. And after that, we realized you know, if uh, engineers can you know, close some deals, why not hire a sales team? That's why we hired a sales team. And at that time, we do not have a marketing team because we really do not want to spend money to generate leads. Right? If a product works, you know, sooner or later, you are going to get some customers. That's why we we'll focus on the, the product side and also, we, and, uh, we hired uh, quite a few sales rep. Just uh, until 2015, we built a marketing team, mainly for the brand awareness, not for leads. I think uh, the, the goal is to make sure your product works. That's really, really important. And uh, if, your pro if your product does not work, nothing will matter. Yeah. So I know that you built a virality into your product by giving uh, freemium model, if you might. That's very important. Yeah. So what's your advice to people who are selling to the enterprises? Is that a good model? What are the perils? What works? What no. doesn't work? Yeah, that's a great model because you look at the, you know, the trend in the enterprise. You know, used to be you, know, you build a solution for the height of IT of CIO. CIO also make a decision. Today, CIO also makes a final decision. You've you got to make sure from security and the perspective from enterprise readiness perspective is very important. Also, at the same time, end users are very, very important. You know, over one third of workforces today are millennials here in the United States. And if any user do not like your product, I think you have no chance. Mm -hmm. right? If any user they like your product, and plus you also can build those enterprise features, very likely you're going to win. Right? That's why you know you got to make sure folks on the product experience, make sure end user like your product. That's why free product is very important. Otherwise, how could end user try your product? You got to make it very, very easy. I know you, there was, uh, in doing my research, I found there was a lot of argument about what should the price be. Should it be $10 <laughs> a user or 15 or 20 
how did you arrive at whatever decision you arrived at, and what's, in hindsight, what do you think uh, is the advice to others who are thinking about pricing their product? Yeah, so on day one, our philosophy is the best product, lowest price. However, I think we went to the extreme case. You know, when we, you know, came up with the product, we tried to monetize, our pro price, price is uh, per month only 9.99. We think that's very, very good pro uh, price. However, and every time when we talk to the customer, the customer, they do not believe what we told them. So, are you sure this is only 9.99? Every time a customer, you know, they do not believe that that's a price. So finally, we increased the price by 50%. Even today, the 14.99. After that, I think uh, you know, customer feel very comfortable. I would say, you know, you want to keep the price. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, I, I want to make sure when you you know think about the the, the best product, the lowest price. Also, make sure listen to customers. Sometimes too low may not be good. So, yeah. so um, you know, when I look at it, uh, you know, your growth was always uh, to the outside. When look at your 10K, it's an amazing growth. But I'm sure every startup goes through a roller coaster ride. Yep. So, what were kind of the low points that you encountered, and how did you overcome them? I think uh, first of all, you know, don't always think about the growth. You know, like, uh, you see, from here, drive to San Francisco. If you drive like 100 miles, you know, an hour, you might get there 10 minutes earlier. But guess what? The risk is very high, right? You might get a you know, ticket from police. So from our perspective, we always spend the time to take care of our existing customers. You know, don't always try to pursue new customers. That's why we really do not focus on the, the growth and really focus on the customer experience. Make sure existing customers are happy. If existing customers are happy, very likely you get a new customers. Because quite often, you know, they take a CIO community, for example. You know, they all, always have some events, right? If your product does not work, you do not care about them. Guess what? You know, you know, they, they are, they are going to spread the word very, very quickly. You know, so you do not have a good reputation. That's why focus on existing customers. Care about existing customers more important than, than the growth, than pursuing the new customers. I think very well said, because for some reason, the American companies are more focused on trying to get new customers. I mean, we all get a call from you know, AT&T or Comcast, <laughs> always trying to uh, you know, sell you a better deal if you become a new customer, as opposed to <laughs> maintaining me as an existing customer. So that's a really very, very good advice. Um, you know, you also did something unconventional, like I pointed out earlier. Your IPO was the only company which is profitable. <laughs> kind of the good old-fashioned way of doing business, which is what I think still works. But I'm sure there was a lot of pressure from your investors to grow, grow, grow. No, no, that's, that's not the case. Uh, our investor is pretty good, actually. The Sequoia, Emergent Capital, Horizon Ventures, seriously, they never give us pressure to, hey, focus on growth. You know, they really focus on one thing, our NPS score, right? If our NPS score for now is 71, if that score is down to like 60 or 50, we are going to have a huge problem. So let's, uh, let's switch away from this kind of stuff because, you know, I think I've met a lot of people and I did a lot of research on you talking to a lot of your employees. And there was a common theme that, hey, we are very happy. I even had an employee tell me a story that he wanted to attend to his family and travel and you gave him a, a travel pod that he can go in his uh, van and, you know, have his whole trip. And I think on this stage a few years ago, Tony Shea mentioned about happiness, yep. and I've not heard that since. You're the second person who's talking about happiness. I, I kind of want to understand what, what, what is your philosophy there? Yeah, sure. So yeah, it's more like a personal story. So when I, when I was very young, I always asked about my you know, self questions, what's the purpose of life? Right, because you know, when we were born, everybody the same. You know, in the future when we die, also the same thing. Right, the only difference is the, the you know the process of life. You know, what's the definition of the process? That's life. Then my question will be, what's the purpose of that, of life? I don't have answer, and for a long, long time, and later on I realized the purpose of life is to pursue happiness. And but what kinds of happiness are sustainable? It's not a dream by power, by money, by a lot of other things. And the sustainable happiness comes from making others happy. Mm -hmm. This is kind of more like a, the personal story. 
I really like that. And uh, when I started Zoom, I applied that philosophy to our business. For me as a CEO, my number one job is not about a customer, partner, product. My number one job is to make sure all of our employees are happy. If our employees are happy, they are going to make a customer happy. If we make a customer happy, our business is sustainable. If our employee happy, I'm happy. Also, that happiness is sustainable. That's why we think about every day how to make sure employee happy, how to make sure customer happy. That's our philosophy. How do you, how do you make that happen, though? It's a very, it's a very, it's easier said than done. But you have created a culture which is really fostering that. So I want you to tell us a little bit about you know, the other entrepreneurs who want to emulate that, how do I create that kind of a culture in my organization? So first of all, ideally on day one, when you start a company, you have a very well defined, what's your company culture? What's your company value? Our company culture deal with happiness. Our company value, just one word, care. You know, care about the community, customer, company, teammates, as well as yourselves. And also, you need to lead by example. Right? You know, when, when it comes to hiring, hire those employees who can fit well, well to your culture. You know, make sure don't hire those people who are very arrogant. You know, stay humble. It's very, very important. Hire those people working very hard, motivated themselves, want to learn something, and this is very important. After they join you, you really you know, need to you know, tell your employees, this is our company. We want to build a, a, a company culture where we all enjoy working together. You know, that's why uh, uh, quite often all those ideas are coming from employees because they are part of this family. You know, like from our perspective, we, we promote a self-learning. You know, some people mentioned, hey, I want to buy, buy a book. The book is very expensive. Can we reimburse that? Yes, why not? And later on, some people mentioned, I also want to buy a book for my kids. Can I re reimburse that? Yes, that's a great idea. That's why we also reimburse the book, no matter, you know, you buy it for yourself or by your family. All those ideas, we also have a happiness crew, you know, from each office, you know, some you know, more like some volunteers here, you did a great job, you know, volunteer for this Taikon event. We also have so many volunteers, you know, at Zoom as well. You know, their free time, you should organize some event, come up with some ideas. I think you do all those things, right, small things together, I try to make an employee happy. Also, you need to get a feedback as well. You know, so one thing I told our employees, and also myself as well, every morning when you wake up, ask the first question, do you feel happy or not? If you do not feel happy, feel free to stay, stay, stay at home. You do not need to come to office. Please take a step back. Try to understand the root cause, why you are not happy. If a family related, make sure to fix that problem. If a business related, make sure you raise your hand, try to you know, work together with others you know, to fix that problem. Right? Happiness has got to be you know, everything. Not just to focus on one thing, your employee will be happy or customer will be happy. So I heard uh, that Transparency is another hallmark of how you conduct your culture in the company. And I'm sure there are, you know, I'm curious to know what kind of transparencies you have had and how is it going to change now that you are a public company too? Yeah, because, you know, startup a company, everything is about speed, right? So without the trust, there's no speed, right? How to build a tr trustable environment, you know, the co a culture. You got to keep everything open, right? You know, from my perspective, I always assume everything I'm doing, all the employees will know that or should know that. And that's a, my more like a you know, decision-making principle. I don't think about, oh, you do this. See, like you want to increase, you know, sort of merit increase for some of employees. You know, do not do that for other employees. Never think about that. You should make sure everything you are doing, all employees will know that. Keep a very open, transparent culture. Because if you trust them, you've got to share everything with them. Right? So this is our you know, philosophy. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. I went around and talked to four or five of your employees and talked to them individually. And I was trying to see if happiness is just a marketing buzzword or are they really happy. And uh, I'm pleased to tell you that I wasn't able to break any one of them to say they're not happy. <laughs> so thank uh, you. I think I've met a lot of successful executives who've done really, really well. But I have actually never met a man who is as humble as you. Okay. And you know, the way you come across and you are so reachable, most of the time when I send emails, I get responses mm -hmm. from handlers trying to control every little detail. But in your case, you are upfront and open, direct, direct communication. So you know, there are only so many hours in the day. <laughs> How do you find time for that? 
I think, first of all, you know, and uh, my father told me that, unfortunately, he passed away the year before I started a company. My father told me that it's two, two things, stay humble, work hard. And uh, I, I don't want my father in the heaven down, right? Every day I remind myself, stay mm. humble, keep working hard. So um, just to talk a little bit about your, um, your family, since you said you, know, you are in our age group where you, know, you have children who are adults. And uh, I heard one of your son wants to be an NBA star. And so I try to help NBA to have more diversity and inclusivity. So it, it did not well, work you out. You could go buy a team, and you can get the diversity. It's not that hard. Uh, but I'm curious, so you know, Asian parents, so do you man manage, make sure his grades are still okay, or is he allowed to skip the grades and? That's a great question. So yeah, my son used to be a hawker school, great school. He's really want to be an NBA player. So that's why he transferred to other school, but uh, you know, did not work out because I cannot blame him. I can only blame his parents' gene, right? I'm not very tall, so. And I would say is you got to respect the kids' decision. I do not push them very hard for the grade. You know, when I was in college, I did not go to a good college at all. Right? To make sure the kids are happy is very important. Otherwise, even if they get an A or A plus, you know, 20 years later when they look back, they do not have a very happy childhood. That's a, that's a terrible, right? You got to make sure they enjoy the life. You know, the life you know is when they after they graduate from a college, you know, a lot of the time, right? That's okay. You know, let them pursue their own dream. That's why I do not push my kids very hard. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if these people are uh, clapping because that's how they want to emulate or... Uh. <laughs> so one last question. Uh, what's next for Eric and what's next for Zoom? Uh, first of all, I think for me, you know, I, I really enjoy, you know, working at a zoo and, uh, you know, make sure our customer happy, employee happy, and uh, even, if we, even if we became a public, Nasdaq public company, I think nothing has changed. So every day, you know, still, you know, uh, keep working hard, you know, stay humble. I think uh, for me, I really, you know, see like uh, I learn a lot from other successful entrepreneurs, leaders. I know if I have more time, I also want to help others as well. And I think this is a great culture. You know, everybody you know, helps each other you know, to make the world a much better place. I think that's probably something I'd like to spend more time on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.